May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. George Herbert was a hack. It's probably why I like him. <laughs> I realise you're probably here because Herbert was a world-class poet, probably one of the best in the English language, or because his vision of priests and parish is one which epitomised the English church from the Reformation until, well, about the other day. <laughs> that may be why you're here. I'm here because he was a hack. As once was I, when I used to shuffle into Oriel Evensong every Sunday and gently snooze through the sermons. I could never quite work out whether it was better to sit here, where my snoozing would not offend the preacher, but would certainly catch the disapproving eye of the chaplain, or there, <laughs> where the chaplain could labour under the illusion that I was fully involved in this act of divine worship, but the preacher had the indignity of an undergraduate gently snoring before his face. <laughs> For some reason, it was only in my third year that it occurred to me that I could actually sit somewhere else in the chapel <laughs> and avoid this binary choice. Change came slowly to Oriel in those days. <laughs> but I was tired for a good reason, or so I told myself. For in those heady days I was a hack, and sleep was the cost of my ascent up the greasy poles of Alka and the Oxford Union, and for good measure an attempted stab at Anzu, which was rather vain, and the professorship of poetry, which is, yes, elected, and which I did not, no, in fact, win. Although I did beat a real poet into fifth place, which I'm sure as a win. <laughs> so I am here not for the poet, nor for the priest, but for the hack. A Cambridge man, but we can forgive him that. When young, he was desperately pleased with himself, and desperately keen to get elected. There wasn't a Cambridge Union in those benighted days, or much, no doubt, to everyone's relief, some version of Aozu, or whatever they call it there. But there was the position of public orator, and this was closely fought in those days. The post was interesting. You represented the university at public occasions, not least in front of the king. And you delivered speeches on high political matters every week, which, if the Donalds thought good enough, were published and dispersed widely. It was a sort of major newspaper columnist position, but with actual credibility, and was often a stepping stone, not only to becoming an MP, but to be made one of the two secretaries of state. So it was in its way, like the presidency of the Union. And Herbert wanted it desperately. He devoted himself extracurricularly to learning Italian, Spanish, and French very perfectly. He canvassed. He got the outgoing orator to make him his deputy on a number of occasions so he had the chance to shine. He spent so much time on the campaign that his patron and proposer, a fellow of Trinity College, his Cambridge, wrote pretty sharply, threatening to pull his support from the campaign, as this was distracting him from the study of divinity. Any cheaters here tonight may know exactly what he meant. He even went so far as to take it up with Herbert Stepfather. And in Herbert's reply, we get a hint of a thought that gets transformed into a poem and then gets turned into a hymn, and which we will sing in a few minutes. 
This dignity, he says, hath no such earthiness in it, but may very well be joined with heaven. A good way to get out of being rusticated. All may of thee partake, nothing can be so mean, which with this tincture, for thy sake, will not grow bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divide. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. Even when being defensive, even when he kind of knows he's in the wrong, there is an insight here into human nature, which is why poet, priest, and hack go so well together. Because if I may make a defense of my former almost profession, then one thing a good hack is good at, it's human nature. What makes people tick? What makes people vote? What makes people cheer? What drags a person out on a cold day in seventh week to vote? Human nature is the raw material of politics, even in most politicians don't seem to realize it. Herbert was good at human nature. But that didn't help his political career go very far. He won his election and was a very good public orator. His speeches are witty and clever, if perhaps a tad self-satisfied because of their cleverness. And he makes sure to use all his skills to back James I's policy of peace with Spain. His motto, James I, as I'm sure you all know from having studied his statue over the gates of the Bodleian, is Beati Pacifici, blessed are the peacemakers. And during his reign, our young hack did well. He became an MP, but then the king died, and Charles I took over. And Charles I would not have appreciated our young hacks speeches against war, having been personally humiliated by the Spanish during a rather madcap escapade when he snuck into Spain with the Duke of Buckingham trying to woo the Spanish Infanta's hand in marriage. So Herbert subtly gave up his plans for advancement. And having previously had a dispensation from having to be ordained, as fellows in both of the universities in those days had to be, in order that he could serve as an MP, he now demanded a dispensation to waive the year's training in order to be ordained straight away. And he didn't just get ordained and stay at Cambridge. He went out and went off into his parishes, and there he died, three years later, not yet 40. And somehow, our young hack turned himself into one of the most profound poets of the English language and one of the most influential English priests of history. He used the skills of rhetoric and an insight into human nature and turned them to good and turned them to God. And it wasn't just insight into human nature that makes him a poet and priest still devoured today. It was his insight into the divine. Richard Baxter, a dreadful old Puritan, but we can forgive him that, said, Herbert speaks to God like one that really believeth in God, and whose business in the world is most with God. Heart work and heaven work make up his books. Herbert looks on human nature honestly, and he looks on God honestly. And in both, he is astonishingly, mind clearingly honest. He gets the interplay between ambition and devotion, and between drudgery and the divine, because he's been there. He's explored what it means to be ambitious and what it means to be bored. 
His poem, Affliction, takes us searingly through life. And I commend it to you, although I shan't read it all tonight. He starts with pride, as he would. The pride of youth, the feeling that he was doing God a favour by his work. When first thou didst entice to thee my heart, I thought the service grave. It was very good. But he takes us cleverly from the time when there was no month but May to a devastating when I got health thou took'st away my life and more for my friends die. And in the devastation of the death of three siblings in little over a year, he opens up a seriously honest account of his fury with God. Thou often didst with academic praise melt and dissolve my rage. I took thy sweetened pill till it came where I could not go away, nor persevere. And he goes on until he ends ambiguously with the plea. Ah, my dear God, though I am clean forgot, let me not love thee if I love thee not. There is something devastating about this poem as there is about so much of his poetry. He sees the darkness and he isn't afraid to speak of it. His poem on the frustration of the priesthood, the collar, I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad, is dark and furious and honest, with a beautiful rhetorical flourish at the end, optimistic this time. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild, at every word, methought I heard one calling child, and I replied, my Lord. Because for all that he knows human nature, and isn't afraid to own it, for all that he is not afraid to name the dark, he also knows and names the light. It is the interplay of his conversation with God, with his honesty about himself, that takes his writings away from the clever stuff he wrote in politics to something so profoundly deep. Love made me welcome, but my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I. Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. No, not, says love, who bore the blame. My dear, that I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. I hope you will forgive a full recounting of that poem. But this is a telling of God that needs to be heard. This is a God whom it is really worth worshipping. The PR merchant for the king has become the herald for the divine. The man who can make heaven in ordinary can make God something understood. So I come, like him, a retired hack, a parson, tilling his corner of the vineyard, unless with the gifts of insight into human nature, which God gave him, unless with an extra year of life, so God. <laughs> to sing the praise of the man who gave us such music at midnight by way of prayer and death that we might gain a glimpse of God, of the God he loved through the poetry he wrote, and thereby that we might follow the journey of our own knowledge and love of God which might in its own small way touch others <coughs> as Herbert has touched us. 
This is the famous stone that turneth all to God. For that which God doth touch and own, cannot for less.